Okay. All right, if you have a Bible tonight, let's turn to two places. Uh, we'll turn to Genesis chapter 22 and James chapter 2. Genesis 2, or 22 and James chapter 2. Now I'm going to talk to you a while tonight about the faithful man. We hear a lot of talk about Christian being faithful and oh ye of little faith. And we need to learn something about what a faithful man is. We can learn from the scripture. And this is the most faithful man in the Bible as far as the record is concerned. And this man is so faithful in James chapter 2, verse 23, he's called the friend of God. He's called the friend of God. It's quite a title. And James, in that uh, epistle that he writes, and James, in that epistle, makes a, 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 a note. Uh, he's very careful to tell you that the friendship of this world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore be a friend of this world is the enemy of God. And then he talks about uh, uh, Abraham there and says Abraham is the friend of God. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 22 and Genesis chapter 22 and come along to this passage. The blessing you'll get from this passage is in remembering just two things. If you want to really get a blessing from the passage, you remember just two things. You remember that story in Genesis chapter 22 that Abraham in that story is a type of God the Father. Abraham is a type of God the Father. That's why he's called Father Abraham in the New Testament. That's why I'm talking about the rich man in hell. The rich man in hell says, Father Abraham. And the one that answers him is talking for God. The one that answers him is maybe a little, little Abraham, but he called Father Abraham. And he says, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime thou receivest thy good thing, and likewise, likewise Lazarus evil. The Jews bragged about being the sons of Abraham. And John said, don't think to say with yourselves or Abraham's children, because God is able these stones to raise up children of Abraham. So in that story there, Abraham's a picture of God the Father. Then obviously in that story, Isaac has to be a picture of God the Son. That's a little more clear. That's clear from the New Testament. That is when Paul gets talking about the, the chosen seed in the New Testament, he says the promise for Abraham and his seed, not the seed, plural, but uh, as to one, that is Christ. So Paul clearly delineates uh, Isaac as a type of Jesus Christ. So of this story, if you remember that Isaac's a type of Jesus Christ the Son, and Abraham's a type of God the Father, you'll get a blessing. All right, now Genesis chapter 22 begins this way. Genesis 22, verse 1. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. That's a bad way to start. <laughs> the Bible says God doesn't tempt any man. Genesis chapter 10, God doesn't tempt any man, uh, neither can he be tempted. Every man is tempted when he has drawn away of his own lust and enticed. That kind of thing gets folks upset with the King James Bible, you see. But there's no need to be that way because the Bible is self-interpreting. And when the Bible gives you something like that, it's always, it's always careful to explain it. Uh, for example, when he, when he, in Hebrews chapter 11, when he's talking about Abraham's faithfulness, you know what he says? He says, by faith, when Abraham was cried, he offered up Isaac, his son. So that shows you there are two kinds of temptations. And one kind of temptation is not a temptation to sin. One kind of temptation to trial. And those evidently are good. Because you know what James said? He said, blessed is the man that doeth temptation, for when he is cried, he shall see the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised them and love him. Now that kind of a temptation there is a trial or a testing. And James says, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various uh, temptations. Knowing the trial of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have a perfect work. So he's talking about a trial in the passage. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham, saying, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am, here am I. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee the land of Moriah, and offer him for a burnt, uh, burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, if ever a fellow got tested, that fellow got tested. He's saying, take your only begotten son, uh, the one he gave the promises to, and take that boy you didn't get to, you were 99 years old, your wife was 90, and the only boy you got, take him out and kill him. And all the promises were to be through him. He said, I promise you I'll make your seed like the stars of heaven, and this shall not be your heir, Eleazar, but he shall come forth out of your own bowels, going to be your heir. All the promises God gave Abraham, he gave to him through Isaac. Now he's telling that boy that he gave those promises to, take him out there on a hill and kill him. Isn't that something? 
Now, the first thing I want to say about the faithful man is this. The faithful man is going to be tested. The verse says, after these things, the Lord tempted Abraham, put him a trial, tested him. And if you're faithful, you are going to be tested. You're not going to buy a car without trying it out. You're not going to buy a piece of property without looking at it. And uh, if for some pass the test, you'll take it. If it don't, you won't. And you think God has some sense. God doesn't do things any different. And uh, the Bible says, all they that live God in Christ, you shall suffer persecution. And if you're going to do something for God, going to amount to anything in this earth, you know what God's going to do? He's going to test you. The faithful man is going to be tested. That's all there is to it. Back in World War II, a GI got in the barracks there. And of course, this probably happened more than once, but this was a particular Christian GI in a certain barracks. And there were Christians in there. I never met any, but I'm sure they were in there looking back over things. They just were kind of quiet. They didn't say much, most of them. But anyway, he got in there, and the first night uh, they lay down in the barracks to go to sleep. He prayed before he went to sleep. And when he did, you know, somebody cussed while he was praying. Everybody laughed. Next night he got out to pray, and somebody threw a, threw a boot jack at him while he was praying. And the third night he got down to his knees to pray again, and somebody started to fire off a blank up there in the barracks. And about that time, the sergeant in charge of the barracks, staff sergeant, said, Leave him alone, he can take fire. Leave him alone, he can take fire. But you know what God will do with you? God will see if you can take fire first before he use you. He'll test you to see if you can take fire. Now, an old lady one time, she had a Bible. In that Bible, she had more of scores of times by verses. She'd have a little thing there that said, TP, 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 T dot, P dot. One day, her grandson asked her, said, Grandma, what's that TP mean I see all over your Bible? She said, that's by a promise. And said so that TP means tried and proven. Tried and proven, tried and proven, tried and proven. It's going to be tried. If the Word of God is going to be tried, he said the Word of God is tried. If the Word of God is tried, you going to get out of it? I don't think so. Tried and proven. The faithful man is going to be tested. There's no way you can get around it. Uh, we have students come to PBI, and some last three years, and some don't. About half of them do. I, I was complaining about it one day to one of my friends talking about it, this and that and other thing. And he said, well, how many people you have graduated? I said, about half. If you have 24 come in the first year, about 12 of them graduate. If you have 48 come in the first year, about 24 of them graduate. He said, well, what are you complaining about that for? That's just about the same average I have anywhere. I never thought about that, you know. Now, I was raised in a generation where you, you finish what you started. You finished. You finished. A, if you were dead, you finished dead. But you finished. You did, the quitting went out of the question. Um, you fired the last round, then, then you threw rocks. <laughs> and it's always been hard for me to, to understand a generation see like that. But they like that. They like that. And things come up. Now I'll tell you some things that test us. Persecution tests us. Poverty tests us. Pain tests us. You'll be tested by pain. Pain will show you what you like. Many times the test, you know what it's for? It's to show you what you like. Uh, sometimes you don't understand yourself what you're like. Uh, God Almighty, when he has the test come, nine times out of ten, it's not for him to see something manifest in you. It's to see have you see something manifest in yourself you're not aware of. Persecution tries us. Ridicule tests us. Loneliness tests us. Uh, you, you, what, what is a temptation or a, or for you is not a temptation for me. Why, the scholars crew I hang out with, my peers, I guess, they're certainly not my mentors, uh, my peers, the scholarly crowd I hang out with, you know, the bunch that were the PhDs and stuff, my crew, you know what they're afraid of more than persecution or sin or death or hell of the judgment seat of Christ? Ridicule. Honest to God. They're so afraid that somebody think they're stupid or a hillbilly or a redneck or an old-fashioned Bible-thumping, hellfire and damnation hillbilly doesn't know anything. They'd rather blow their head off than be laughed at. That's why I give them so much trouble. I like to ridicule them. I'd call them meatheads and bat-brained idiots and jackasses and fools and don't have the sense God gave a brass monkey and if you don't have enough spirituality to put in the left eye of a blind mosquito and they just... just <laughs> I'm just torturing them to death, you know, they can't stand it. So they get to work on me, you know, you know, and Ruckman, you know, and Ruckmanism. But, you know, I figure I'm prepared. I'm prepared to take it, man. Whatever you dish out, you've got to be able to take. Well, I'm prepared. <laughs> you say, judge not lest you be judged. Let her rip, buddy. Let her rip. 
You say, well, you get back what you give out. That's very true, and there's more coming. <clears throat> you say, why? I can take it. They can't. They can't. They can make fun of me, and I think, uh, ho-hum, you know, please pass the salt. It's nothing to me. I mean, you know, you know the generation said that I was raised in, we said, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Well, let's talk. Oh, let's talk. Talk cheap, man. Talk cheap. But well, some of the day he said, Ruckman, you know so-and-so? I said, well, I've heard about him. never met him. I heard of him. He said, well, you know, I talked to him the other day. Met him the other day. He said, you know, he doesn't like you. He hates your guts. I said, good. Good. Isn't that wonderful? It's wonderful to have some people like that around, isn't it? He said, well, what a, what a blessing it is to have enemies, you know. <laughs> they help keep you awake, you know. I mean, friends come and go. Well, one good enemy lasts you for a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I hope I make at least two good enemies every time I come up here. At least two. If I'd make two, I'd consider the meeting to be a failure. <laughs> I bet you haven't heard that positive approach for a while, have you? <laughs> I mean, folks don't understand that. I understand. I understand things perfectly. You know, I've, 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 I'm, I'm acquainted with history. I'm not one of these fellows who forget the letter, the lessons of history. I study history. You know what John Wesley told these young preachers when they went out to preach? They go out to preach and they come back and he'd say, uh, what kind of results you had? And they'd say, well, not much. And John Wesley'd say, anybody get mad? And the young man would say, no. And they'd say, anybody get saved? And the young man would say, no. And he said, young man, God hadn't called you to preach. That's what John said. John said, if they don't get convicted, they're going to get mad. And if you don't convict them and get them mad and convict them and convert them, you're not doing anything anyway. I don't worry about it. You're going to be tested. You're going to be tested. You can't get around it. Years ago, there was a cripple who used to send letters to people in prison. He'd write these prisoners in a certain prison and send them letters. He'd labor over those letters. I mean, really work over them. And they're good letters. He'd write out a letter about once a month and put a scripture in it and words of encouragement and stuff and mail that thing out and to a penitentiary and they gave it to the prisoners. He never got a word of thank you from anybody. Never heard a word from any of the prisoners even looked at the thing. And after about a year of that, sending about 12 letters out there, he got uh, real discouraged and said, well, nobody's reading those things anyway. I'm going to quit writing. So he quit writing. And he missed the first month's mail sending in. And he got a letter from the warden and it said, would you please write this writing on better paper than you've been sending? Better quality of paper. These letters are getting worn out passing between the hands of the inmates who have been reading them. They're getting worn to pieces. Everybody in that prison reading them letters over and over and over again. But you see, the Lord will test you. The Lord will cry you out. See how it goes with you. All right, now the next thing about it is this. The faithful man is not only going to be tested, but he's going to be tested in the thing that he loves. Look at that passage right there, and that passage, pick it up there, and notice what it says in verse 2. Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, whom thou lovest, and get the land of Moriah and offer him there upon a burnt offering upon the mountains, I will tell thee of. Now, most people in America don't read the Bibles too close and don't notice some things. For example, if you were to ask any, almost any American Christian where the word love shows up the first time in the Bible, he wouldn't know. And they're the ones always talking about love. You think a nation was so crazy about love and no hate literature, no hate preaching, and what we need is more love, you know, and the church is split up, you know, and, 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 and cancer in the body of Christ, and what a terrible thing this Christian to treat with the way they have to do, and Chris fundamentalist, the only one that kill her own would blah, blah, blah. you think somebody that hung up on love would know where the word first occurs, wouldn't you? But they don't. Look at it, verse 2. That's the first time you ever saw that word in your Bible. That word is in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. First time you ever saw the word love, right there. There's no songwriter in America that knows that. Not one of them. The first time the word love shows up in the Bible, it's not a man loving a woman. And it's not a woman loving a man. And it sure ain't too queer shacking up. The first time you find word, you know, make love, not war, you know, you know, more love preaching. And Ruckman doesn't have less love in his preaching. You old hypocrite, you don't even where the word came from. Don't sit there and talk to me about love when you're ashamed to confess Christ and ashamed to preach on the street, ashamed to pass out tracts, to tighten your cotton-picking money you can't give 20% to the Lord. Don't give me this gas, okay, boy? 
I get so tired of these gaseous Christians. What do you know about love? Let us not love in word, but love in deed and truth. Find out where it is. That Bible says if any man love God, it's known of him. We know when a fellow loves God and when he doesn't. It's known of him. The first love in that Bible is not a woman loving her baby. You'd think that'd be there, wouldn't you? But he says, can a woman forget her sucking child? She should not have compassion upon the son of her womb. Yea, they may forget Isaiah, but I'll not forget thee. They have meant something. The first time the Bible mentions love, you know what it is? What's love for? It's a father's love for his son. That's the first time that thing shows up. You say, why is that? Can't you guess? Can't you guess? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Can't you guess here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his son to be a propitiation for our sins? That's the business. You're going to be testing things that you love. And that reminds me to say this. Until you've been tested there, you've never been tested. There, if you want to find the measure of a man, there are ways to find that out, but it has very little to do with what he says. Profession comes mighty cheap. I mean, he may be telling the truth, and again, he may not be telling the truth. But if you want to know what a man is, uh, I can tell you in, in a little line, and we'll miss it. We'll miss it a time. I learned this back in the Army in the old days. And I learned things back in the Army. They may not be Scripture, but they're scriptural. And you learn certain things about men there and about things that you, don't, uh, you can't learn, I don't suppose, anywhere else. Uh, for example, I learned one great truth in the, bio, in, the, in the Army. I learned the tough guy is the guy who has the edge. That don't sound like much, does it? Kind of like Murphy's Law. <laughs> but you know what that is? That means the fellow never acts tough unless he knows he has the advantage. It's infallible. It's infallible. The guy knows he has the advantage, he'll act tough. If he doesn't, he'll behave himself. You say, what man? Any man in any, in any situation. If he thinks he's got the edge, he'll t talk tough. You see what I'm talking to you right now? You think I talk to a highway patrolman like I'm talking to you right now? <laughs> well, when a highway patrolman pulls me over for speeding, do you think I talk like I'm talking right now? Well, of course not. You say, what? He's got the edge. He's got the edge. I'm in Cassius Clay, says, I'm the best, I'm the greatest fighter in the world, you know. You know, light as a dove or butterfly or a stamp or lick me or something other. And that guy think, you know, I'm I the greatest fighter in the world. Well, no, I wouldn't say that, no. No, I wouldn't say that. Uh, you're a good boxer, let's put it that way. When you go going fighting, well, now, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I mean, the bunch I came up with, it was a little bunch of, different bunch of regulations. Uh, there weren't any gloves. And there wasn't any bell. There wasn't any umpire, and there was no place you could hit below or above. <laughs> and there was nothing to tell you what you could throw before you hit. <laughs> or what you kicked before you threw. <laughs> I mean, maybe he's the greatest fighter, maybe he's not. I don't know about that. But I know about that. You take Cassius Clay. You know who Cassius Clay is, don't you? I mean, who Cassius Clay is. All right, that's his alias Muhammad Ali, you know. He may be... Muhammad Ali, but he's got feet of clay. <laughs> anyway, you take Cassius Clay and put Cassius Clay down on a chessboard, he'll behave himself. You won't hear him, I was going to do this, not going to, you won't even shut your mouth and behave yourself, fellow, what you going to do? The tough guy has the edge. I'll tell you something else I learned. I learned if it don't make sense, there's a buck in it. <laughs> See? <laughs> Now, that don't look like much either. That's profound, man. That's profound. Most profound things you ever heard. If it don't make sense, there's a buck in it. Whenever you find out something that doesn't make sense in the social world, the political world, the religious world, the economic world, foreign relations, there's a dollar bill behind it every cotton-picking time. I never known to fail. And I, I learned those things. You know what else I learned in the, in, in the service by watching men and observing men being around men? You know what I learned? I learned that a man is what he loves and what he is afraid of. That's the man. If you want the measure of a man, you'll find out two things about him. What scares him and what he loves. That's the man. I mean, the talk is just the talk. But you want to get the man, you find out what scares him. You find what he loves. That's him. That's him. And if you've never been tested what you love, friend, you've never been tested. Take thy son. Thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. That's going to be a test. 
That's going to be a dilly. And offering for a, a, a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, I will tell thee of. One day the devil shows up in glory and says, Morning. The Lord says, Morning. Where you been? Oh, going to and fro on the earth, walking up and down. In it. You considered my friend uh, Abraham? None like him, a just man, one that fears God and shews evil. He's my friend. Oh, I don't know about that. He's my friend. I can count on him. Listen, Lord God. The devil's audacious. He doesn't fear God. He comes to God just like that. He don't fear God. If he'd fear God, he wouldn't be a devil. He comes, listen, Lord God. Call out a friend. He's got a friend down there. Well, I got women down there. If the witch doctor tells them, put the baby in the anthill, they'll stand there and watch the ants eat the baby. You got a friend? You ain't got anybody like that. Friend, you my friend. I got women down there taking babies and throwing the Ganges and let the crocodile eat them. I got people down there that give the kids to me and throw them off a cliff and sacrifice them to me. You haven't got any friends like that. Yeah, I do. Abraham, my friend. You want to bet? You're faded. Shoot. <laughs> that's, that's a modern, up to date translation. That's a, a living Bible or something, see? <laughs> You're faded. Shoot. And the Lord says, uh, try him out. The devil says, you try him. This is all I will. Come down, Abraham, Abraham, here am I. Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee the land of Aunt Moriah, and offer him for a burnt offering. That's what the heathen did with the kids. They made them pass through the fire. Didn't you ever read your Old Testament? Make them pass through the fire, pass through the fire. They burned them. They burned them alive. Take your boy out there and burn him. And keep on reading. Next verse. Come on down there in verse 3. Now Abraham rose up early in the morning, over the wood for a burnt offering, got him some young men there with a couple of donkeys, and off they went, and went to the place that God told him of. You know what that tells me? That tells me the faithful man will go where God tells him to go. Are you faithful? When God tells you to go somewhere, do you go? People are something, aren't they? Aren't they? I have God... If any time I want to check my consecration, you know what I ask myself? I ask myself, if God called you to be set up a rescue mission in Fairbanks, Alaska, would you go? Whew, man. I didn't like to think about that. And while the temperature gets below, below 50 degrees, man, I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to go home. Now, of course, hockey is different. Hockey is different. <laughs> But when hockey, 20 degrees about right for hockey. I played outdoors at Lansing here when it was 15 degrees. You just sweat like a horse. As long as I'm sweating, I'm okay. But you stop this stuff under 50 degrees. I got a friend up there in Canada named uh, Garland Cofield, old Tennessee Temple boy from Tennessee. And he phoned me up uh, about once every four or five years in the middle of the winter. He'll phone me up and say, well, that old southern draw, you know, come out of Dryden, Ontario. I well, said, so well, Brother Robin, I just thought I'd have a little time here to kill. I thought I'd ask you some Bible questions if you got time. I said, okay, how's it doing going up there? Oh, it's been a pretty cold winter. We're snowed in there. Been snowed in about two weeks, but we'll be out in a while. I'll say, well, what's the temperature? Well, it warmed up to 30 below yesterday. <laughs> oh, my God. I just, the phone starts going like this, you know. So if I want to get a test of myself, I know where my testing area is. Do you know where yours is? Mm-hmm. Lord, I put it on you. I put it on you. You go where God tells you to go. God told you to enter the ministry. Would you do it? God told you to go to the Philippines or Russia. Would you go? God told you to go to church Sunday night. Would you go or someplace else? That's how to check a faithful man. A faithful man will go where God tells him to go. I've got a couple of friends down there in Pensacola. I say they're, they're, they say, you fellas, friends, I don't have any fellowship with them, you know, in the condition they're in, but I, I like them. I always did like them. They're likable guys, but they've just been messed up, messed up, messed up. They got saved. They never got rid of liquor. They got stayed on the bottle. They had a time they fought that thing for years and years and years. One of them, he's the sweetest fellow you've met in your life. He sobers up sometime two or three years at a time. And after about three years, wham, he hits the bottom again. Well, the guy's right, he'll come to church. Every time he comes to church, he brings somebody with him. Every time he brings somebody with him, they get saved. I've looked out of my congregation and seen 100 people out there, 200 people, never touch a drop of liquor all year round. They never let a soul to Christ in their life. Strange world, isn't it? 
He would take that fellow there, you know, if that fellow would just go where God told him to go all the time, he'd stay out of trouble, but he'd go some places God didn't tell him to go. And he messes up his life. I know a boy down there got off that bottle for years. I think about 20 years. Raised a family. And came to church, and then he got back with some buddies, went out deer hunting one day, and some guy got a fifth and got past that thing around, they got back in the bottle again, and he came back home, boy, in less than 24 hours, he just cleared out of town and gone back to the mountains of Carolina where he'd come from, and got back up there and disappeared back in those bushes where he used to bootleg, and just stayed up there and died a drunk. And he's a professing Christian. What's wrong with those people? They don't go where God tells them to go. I know people started going to a church, and then church troubles showed up, and the saints had all kinds of troubles. But it's when they got discouraged and got down the mouth and figured, what's the use? So everybody's a hypocrite and so forth and so on. And God would say, don't you quit because of them. Don't you quit because of them. You follow me. But they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. I'm not going back that place. You're not going to catch me dead around there and that kind of thing. I remember one time I had a fellow. I met a fellow one time in Pensacola. His name was Bird. And Bird uh, had a little old girl who was 12 years old dying of leukemia. And she's in the hospital. I went to see her a couple of times. And I talked with Bird about his spiritual condition, tried to get him to come out to church. And no, I, 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 I can't do that. He said, why not? I said, I've tried that before. So what do you mean? He said, well, I've only been saved, he said, about three years. And he said, right as soon as I got saved, I went to a church. And he said, I got into church and I hadn't been there then a, about a week. And they had a big old business meeting, a big old split. I watch those Christians throw stuff at each other and yell at each other and cuss each other and get mad at each other. So I'm never going back in, in a church like that again. He said, my little girl got sick and I'd stayed out of church about a year. My little girl got sick and I told the Lord I'd go back and get things right. And I went back to the second church and he said, I hadn't been in that church a week. Then they had a business meeting. <laughs> and away it went again, you know. Everybody, you know, slamming, banging around, you know. Christians, Christians can be the meanest devils you ever saw on the face of this earth. Christ, save people, save people. If you don't know that, you don't know Christians. Christians can be just mean to the devil. You say they're not really saved. Yeah, they're saved. Sure, they're saved. They're just mean to the devil. That's all. They get like that. I've been at business meetings where somebody got and slapped somebody in the face with a Schofield Bible. <laughs> <laughs> an old reference, an old Schofield Bible. <laughs> I've been I've been in business meetings where they where they where somebody got up and blacked the guy's eyes. Smacked him right in the, in the eye and blacked his eye. I mean, premillennial, born again, saved, soul winning, independent, fundamental, missionary, Baptist. <laughs> and just as mean as the devil, man. There's something. And he got in this thing and had another business meeting, a big split, and blew up, you know, and that time that did it. So he said, I haven't been back since. And the little girl was dying of leukemia there in the hospital, and she had this oxygen tent over her face. She'd paw at it and say, Daddy, I don't want this here. Daddy, I want this. Take it away, you know. I saw him watch that thing. My heart just bleed, boy. I thought to myself, what a, what a break, what a break. Oh, boy, tries to get right two times, and both times he just walks right into it. But he's been faithful. You know what he'd have done? He'd have tried again. He'd been faithful. And faithfully, God would tell where God told him he go where God told him to go, no matter what was going on there. But they always try to run from it. Try to run from it. Get out of it. They won't go where God tells them to go. They're not faithful. The faithful man goes where God tells him to go. That's the business. Come on down to verse 5. The third day he saw the place afar off. He saw the place afar off there in verse 5. And he said to the man with him, he said, uh, You abide here, and I and the lad will go yonder and return again unto you. Have you ever considered what a remarkable statement that is? I and the lad are going to go up there again and come back to you. Well, how's he going to come, how are they going to come back? They're going to kill him. Well, he isn't coming back unless the Lord raised him from the dead. You know what Abraham thought? Abraham thought God raised that boy from the dead. He had fully intended to kill him. And he had faith to believe God raised him from the dead. That's what Christ meant when he saw Abraham saw my day and was glad and rejoiced. He doesn't mean that Abraham saw the crucifixion and saw the resurrection. But he means by faith Abraham believed in the resurrection. And his boy turns out to be a type of Christ. Of course, Abraham didn't know that. That's how it turns out. And he said, Abraham saw my day, and he said he was glad of it. So he says, that boy, he says, the, the fellow there, he said, you stay there, and I and the boy go up there on the hill, and we'll come back again to you. And they went, both of them, together. That reminds me to say the faithful man believes in a resurrection. The faithful man believes in a resurrection. 
Uh, this idea of a reincarnation, all this stuff, the heathen pagan ideas, have nothing to do with that book at all. That isn't the word of God. The faithful man believes, uh, though he were dead, yet he's going to live. You know what the faithful man believes? He believes what uh, Job believed. Job believed, said, after my death, the worms destroy my flesh, yet I shall see God for myself, whom mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reign be consumed with enemy. And he believed that thing without even a Bible to go by. He just accepted that thing by faith. The faithful man believes what Jesus Christ said, when Jesus Christ said, because I live, you shall live also. Paul says, if Christ didn't come up from the dead, your faith is vain, our preaching is vain, we're hypocrites, we're liars, you're still dead in your sins. But faithful man believes in the resurrection. It was those Athenian philosophers that didn't believe in it. When Paul got preaching the resurrection, they said, uh, what's this new strange doctrine we hear because he preached Jesus Christ and the resurrection? Those old fellows like Plato and Aristotle and that bunch, they didn't believe in the physical resurrection. They didn't believe that God knew what they were doing. They didn't believe they have to give an account to God. The way they were living, they couldn't afford to believe that, I suppose. Socrates was a first go fruity faggot if you ever saw one. But you take that bunch of Greek philosophers, when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, we'll hear you later about this matter. They weren't faithful. The idea is that someday, you know, they think, well, if you live a good life, you'll come back in a better stage. And if you don't live a good life, you'll come back as an animal, you know, or a hippopotamus or a caribou or a white cow or some other. That is to the Billy Kelly, she said one time, she said, uh, my, my first incarnation I was an Egyptian princess and the second incarnation I was a, a Persian princess. And he said, in your third incarnation you were a rock and sat down on your shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> one of those fellows said to somebody like that, said, well, I, I've even come back to the dead. He said, you know, I know what you came back the last time uh, as you came back last time as a nut. <laughs> Now, in a resurrection, you die and you're buried and the grave can't keep you. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? And a faithful man believes that. You say, well, Ruckman, I don't believe it. Okay, you're not faithful. How's that? Free country? You don't want to believe it? Help yourself. You're not faithful. Don't talk about faithfulness. The faithful man believes in the resurrection. All right, come on down there to verse 6. And he says, uh, this boy is talking about the thing there, and he says, uh, they went, he took the fire and the wood, and they went both of them together. You see that thing he says? They went both of them together. That reminds me to say that God the Father and God the Son are in agreement. He says, I came to do the Father's will. Not my will, but thine be done. I rejoice to do thy will, O God. The Father and the Son agree. And that reminds me to say this, that all Christians agree on the main things. Now, I know we Christians disagree on a lot of things. But I'm not so far out left field and such a radical I don't understand that every saved person in this country is my brother, sister, in Christ. I understand that. We're in the same family. That doesn't bother me. It bothers some other folks. It don't bother me any. It must be a terrible thing for those people like Zane Hodges and Curtis Hudson and James Price and James Combs, you know, and David Cloud and Dave Hunt and John Ankerberg and Chuck Swindoll and John Ankerberg. It must be a terrible thing, thing to consider they're in the same family with Ruckman. <laughs> that must be a blow to their dignity they can't survive just think man we have the same father I mean you can choose your friend but you can't choose your family you're born in the family of God you're in the family of God every black man in this country to say is my brother in Christ and every black woman in this country to say is my sister in Christ I understand that perfectly now there's something we can't get together on don't agree on do things differently but there are two things every Christian knows you know a fellow is saved, number one, he's saved from hell. You say, I don't know that. You've never been saved from hell then. When a man's saved from hell, he knows it. He knows it. I mean, he knows what he's saved from. You still don't believe in hell, you've never been saved. Or is it that? That's the first thing you get saved from. The second thing is, you believe when a man is saved, he's saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're saved, you know that's so. You say, well, I, well, we're not talking to you anyway. <laughs> saved people all agree on those two things. Now, they may disagree on some other things. Some of them think you can keep it. Some of them think you can lose it. Some of them think you, uh, you could lose it, but you shouldn't. 
Others believe in the premillennial coming of Christ. Others are postmillennial. Some are amillennial. Some got a pre-tribulation rapture. Some have a post-tribulation rapture. Some may disagree about the sacraments and some other things. But every saved man and woman on the face of this earth knows that if a man saved, if the blood of Christ had saved him, and he is saved from eternal punishment in hell. He knows that. And if you don't know that, you've never met Jesus Christ, or you'd know it. Well, a friend of mine up there in, uh, in Rochester, New York, hey, he'd been working with one of his buddies for a couple of years trying to get him saved. And the fellow was pretty stubborn, didn't do anything. And he, he finally, one night he got a telephone call from his buddy. And the fellow said, guess what, George? He said, that's got saved. He said, you do it. And he said, praise the Lord. And his buddy said, yeah. He said, it happened just the other day. He said, well, tell me about it. He said, well, I haven't got time right now, but I'll tell you what I said. I'm having an Amway party over my house tonight. And I want to have you come over. This Amway is the greatest stuff you ever saw in your life. I just, I just can't wait to tell you about it. And my buddy on the phone said, you never got saved. Amen. Amen. He said, what do you have a right to judge like that for? He said, if you got saved, you'd be phoning me up, telling me either how you got saved or be trying to get me saved. <laughs> you remember what happened to you the first when you got saved? You remember what happened? You, see, you folks got saved, you know, around 20, 30 years old. You remember the first thing that happened? The first thing that happened was you got burdened about somebody you knew. That's the first thing that happened. And you couldn't wait to get to them and tell them what happened to you because you're worried about them. That's what happened. That's what happened. My old buddy Bill Hendricks, he's a played used to play drum in a dance band with him. I, I played in all kinds of dance bands, not just the country western, but the swing band, you know, and the jazz combos, all, all the stuff, you know. And this was a hillbilly band. We played in the Diamond Horseshoe and the Call Club and the Town Pump, you know, and Nothing but the best, you know, the Green Gables, you know, and all. Nothing, nothing but the finest folks, you know. And when I got saved, went back to witness to him. He was playing out there the Diamond Horseshoe, big old dance, up there, treating the lyrics, you know, he's strumming, playing rhythm up there with the microphone. And I came up right to the microphone where the whole dance floor could hear it over the mic. And I came up there and I said, Bill, I said, uh, I just came back to talk to you and give you a track. You know what happened to me? He says, no, what? You know, chunk, 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 chunk. I said, uh, I got saved. He said, well, good, chunk, chunk, chunk. And I said, you know something? I said, when I was down here playing a band with you, I was lost and going away to hell. I didn't know that. I was going to hell. Did you know that? He said, sure, everybody knows that, chunk, chunk, chunk. <laughs> I thought to myself, well, you dirty dog. Well, you dirty dog. You dirty skunk. I mean, that guy had a Christian mother. He raised out in the country, and he knew we were all going to hell. He knew he was going to hell. We were all going to hell. He knew it. He knew it. I didn't know it, but he knew it, that dirty rascal never opened his mouth. That dirty dog. <laughs> he just let me die and go to hell with him, I guess. That's it. Now listen, Christians agree. Now I know how it is with Baptists. And they say if you've got 50 people with 25 different opinions, you've got a Baptist church. <laughs> a lot of truth in that, you know. <laughs> but they agree in the main things. One time a guard at a sanitarium was sitting out there and tapping his knee and while away the time and a man came up to him and he said how long have you been a guard, a security guard at this asylum? He said oh about 20 years he said don't you ever carry a gun with you or a weapon? He said no I don't he said, aren't you afraid these people here will gang up on you and get together and, and, and hurt you? He said crazy people never get together in anything <laughs> and that's the way the Baptists are sometimes you know an atom bomb an atom bomb wiped out everybody on earth except two men they met, and they, they found they were both Baptists. They met one of them and said, all right. And I said, uh, I'm the pastor, he said, and you're the Sunday school secretary, and our goal for next week is three. <laughs> 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 That's the Baptist. All right, come on down there to verse 6. Verse 6. Verse 6, they agree. They agree. They get along. And the way, the way, the way, to, the way for the world to get together is real simple. I'm all for an ecumenical movement, uh, but I want to gather around the person of Jesus Christ. And they want to gather around something else. I know how to get folks together, unsaved and saved people, and black and white, and brown, yellow, and orange, and chartreuse, and indigo. I know how to get them together. I know how to get all the Muslims together, and all the Baptists, and all the Seventh-day Adventists, and Mormons, and all the Hindus, and Muslims, and atheists, how to get them together. Get them saved. Get them saved, man. They'll start getting together where they ought to get together. But it's take Jesus Christ to bring about the right bondage. Years ago, they had a great attack in Pearl Harbor. And I was over there. I went back to Pearl here a couple of months back. Took Pam over there. I took her on a honeymoon in Wackakee Beach in the moonlight, you know. 
And there wasn't any moonlight, though. That was a problem. <laughs> we got over there and uh, took her on a cruise around Pearl Harbor and went back into Pearl and went by the place the Arizona sank, you know, and where the Japs came down. They attacked Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December, you know. Tora, Tora, Tora came sailing down through there. And the leader of that Japanese formation was a fellow called Mitsudo, uh, Mitsudo Fuchita. He got saved after that war was over. That boy was an evangelist for 50 years after World War, 40 years after World War II. And that old boy, and he keep, took that lead plane in on Pearl Harbor, coming in there. And he went by the Arizona, and the Arizona was sinking. And aboard the Arizona sinking, the last man that got off that ship alive was a southerner from Texas. I forget his last name, they just call him Curly. And Curly was on the deck of that thing when Fuchita tore by there, and that ship was going down. And, and Curly said that to somebody later, he said he'd know that fellow's face if he saw it again anywhere on this earth. He said he, he went within 25 feet of him coming by, looking out of the cockpit. And Fuchita got back to Japan. When he got back to Japan, the first thing that happened was a missionary, whom I know, named Timothy Peach, gave him a tract. And the next thing that happened to him was one of his buddies came back from America, who had been a prisoner of war in California, and he was telling him what nice treatment the Americans had given him. And he told Fuchita there was one young lady there that bought him special stuff all the time, took real good care of him. When he asked about who she was, he found out uh, that she was the daughter of some missionaries. He said to Fuchita that we killed over here in Japan. And he said, when I asked that girl why was she so nice to him in view of the fact that we'd murdered her parents, she said, well, I've been trying to overcome evil with good. That hit him bad. That hurt him. That hurt him. And Fuchita got thinking about that thing and thinking about that thing, and he got saved. And when he got saved, at that time, Jack Hiles was pastor at church down in uh, Texas, Garland, Texas, and decided to have one of these special nights, you know, to get the attendance up and everything. So he... Without letting this fella Curly know about it, he invited Fuchita over and got him a flock come over to America. Then he got this seaman aboard the Arizona and got him there the same night. And nobody knew nothing about it. And Curly was sitting there, and pretty soon the Brother Hiles asked Curly to come up and sit on the platform. He did, and he said, I want to introduce you to somebody. And had Fuchita step out of the wings. And he said, you know this man? And Curly came off that bench and said, I know that fellow's face anywhere in the world. That's the fellow flew over the Arizona when it went down. And Fuchita, no, oh, so. <laughs> and those two got up there and hugged each other around that pulpit. Now, that's an ecumenical movement. But they got saved. You get in Christ, those things get fixed up quick. I've been over in Germany five times. And the first time I went over there, I didn't know German well enough to really get in much of a conversation. Anybody but knew a little bit. I went by a Reformed church there, an Evangelist a Lutheran church. And there was only one guy there, a young fellow about, oh, maybe 20 years old. I guess he's some kind of a janitor. I'd gather most of what he told me that I could understand. Some kind of a janitor. Must have been about 20 years old. And I gave him a track, and his face lit up, and he began to blubber and blabber and blubber and blabber, and gave me a big old hug. And the fellow was a saved German. And about to talk to me for 15 minutes. I don't think I understood more than... 20 words in 15 minutes he gave me, and he couldn't speak any English. But just like meeting a brother, close to a brother, my own brother relationship wasn't that close. Really, my real brother. Not even near that close. But what is it? It's conversion. People really say, will agree on the main things. Now, they may disagree about some other things, but the main things they'll, they'll come together on. I come down to verse 8. Verse 8. You get down there to verse 8, and you get down there to verse 8, and uh, the boys begin to get wonder what's going on. And the boy says, well, Daddy, there's the fire. That's a picture of uh, hell. And there's the wood. That's people in Ezekiel. But people are going to be wood to be burned. A flaming flame will burn all faces from north to south in the south forest in the woods. Ah, oh, then I said, Lord God, they speak of me, doth they say of me, doth they not speak parables? <laughs> Talking about hell, and it ain't no parable. So he says, there's the fire, and he says, there's the wood, but he says, uh, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And his daddy says to him, my son, God, look at that, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Now, you understand the double meaning in that thing, the twofold meaning in that thing? The first one is God himself. She's like that, reciprocal. God himself will provide the lamb. 
But the King James words it so it could be God himself could be the Lamb. So they change that in all the new Bibles. They don't like that. They don't like that. God will provide himself an object for the Lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. That reminded me to say this. That reminded me to say the faithful man. That's what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about the characteristics of the faithful man. The faithful man believes in substitution. You say, well, I don't believe in substitution. I believe in make my own way and make my own living. Let nobody do nothing for me and this and that. Uh huh. That's why a lot of men are in hell. You take in America, a lot more women are going to get saved than men. You say, why is that? Generally speaking, the male is more self sufficient. And the male doesn't like anybody doing anything for him. He feels self sufficient in himself. Most uh, women have a, 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 a weakness, at least about their feeling about their ability to take care of themselves. A woman will tend to lean on something or lean on somebody. And so a woman gets under conviction about her sin, nine times out of ten, she gets saved right in the spot. But a man got this, you know, this, uh, this self-important kind of thing. Uh, I've always paid my own way, and I'm going to let somebody pay for me, you know. It's pride, old stinking pride. You stop thinking about the reason why a fellow goes to hell is that simple. I mean, if you know Christ died for your sins, and some of you men know that, and God offers you eternal life free, and you know that, and Christ has paid for your sin debt, and you know that. There's only one reason, just one, why you wouldn't take it. Only one. Pride. Uh-huh. You're just too, too proud to come down and let folks see your condition. Too proud to admit to folks you couldn't save yourself. Too proud you have to depend on somebody to pay it. You're going to pay it. Big boy, you're going to pay it. That's how fellas are. I mean, if you owe somebody 50,000 bucks, you couldn't pay it. No way to pay it. And I came along and said, I love you and I care for you and I'm concerned about you. And I'm going to pay this bill for you. And if this is a good check, it isn't hot and it won't bounce on you. And do you want it? If you want it, just take it. If I said that to you, there'd be only one reason why you wouldn't take it. Right? Come on, folks, right? <laughs> if I'm wrong, correct me. <laughs> why, why else would you turn it down? Unless it was just you were just too proud to take it. That'd be the only reason. Now, some men are. Now, a real man with any sense, a man who's faithful, believes in substitution. You take their men in this country that have worked a double shift to take care of a family and cut off 10 and 15 years off their life. You know, for what? Their life for the family's life. Working for the family. There are mothers in this country that have Christian mothers that have beat themselves to death worrying about their boys and girls and crying themselves to sleep at night about the condition of their children and their life has gone for the life of that boy, that wayward girl. Substitution. You don't believe in substitution? You couldn't get in combat very long and not believe in it. I mean, somebody went to Vietnam if you didn't. Somebody in World War II went over there and fought if you didn't. Somebody laid down your life, their life so you wouldn't have to lay down your life. You don't believe in substitution. Uh, people who believe in uh, combat should believe in substitution. I mean, you know what a rear guard action is? In a rear guard action, you want to save a division, so you make one regiment stay behind and hold them off till the division can get out. You want to get a regiment out, you put back a battalion so the other three battalions can get out. You put back a company. You sacrifice them. There's a small unit, you put back a squad to get a platoon out. It's their life for your life. You take in combat, if you go out there and you're, you're on a reconnaissance mission going out across there, across that field, or wherever you're going across there, you've got to have a one and two scout out. Number one and two scout, we used to call them. They call a fellow now a point man. That's the number one scout, that is, a point man. What does he do? He goes out there first. What does he go out there first for? Draw fire. You have to draw fire. If there's a landmine out there, hit it before you hit it. It's substitution. You believe in substitution. Christ died for Peter S. Ruckman. He died for me. I couldn't die for myself. Why? I'm too yellow. I'm too big a coward. I don't want to burn in hell. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I will, I'll, take, I'll take somebody's death in my place because I don't want to pay for my sins. I've got the courage to pay for my sins. I'm, I'm not that good a man. That's the deal right there, boy. Right there. And some of you rascals won't face that. You'll face it in a flaming lake of fire someday. Got to straighten your theology out. The faithful man believes in substitution. 
A boy been on dope for years and years, came home one night and got an argument with his daddy and got screaming at his daddy and cursing. And his daddy finally gave him a shotgun and he said, what do you want to have me do, blow my brains out? He said, no, go upstairs and blow your mother's brains out. And the boy's mouth dropped open. So what do you mean? He said, take it, float it. His mother's upstairs right now back in the bedroom praying for you. Go up there and blow her brains out. He said, you can't, you don't, you don't mean what you're saying. She might as well. So you've been killing an inch of time here for 10 years. Why don't you just go up and finish it off? That woke the kid up. Made him think. The mom was doing up there. She's paying the price, kid. She's paying the price. You rascal. You scum. You low down, sorry, good for nothing. Sit there and say, I don't believe in the substitution just because it ain't your turn. You know what they do when they take hostages in a military operation? I'll give you a good example. At the Via Masella, that's the name of a road in Rome. They had a German army of occupation parading. They were parading down the street, and some Italian partisans set a bomb for them and killed 32 of them in one blast. I really fixed them up good. 32 of them in one blast. That news got back to Mackinson and Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler gave the decree and said, I want 10 Italians for each German. There were 32 uh, Germans killed. He said, I want uh, 320 Italians killed, reprisal. And that got to the Pope. This was in Rome. And they said, Pope, what are you going to do about it? And he said, shh, don't upset anybody. Shh, don't upset anybody. Don't talk about it. And they said, they're out there in the street choosing them right now. What do we do? Well, we, we don't do anything. We can't, we, 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 there'll be reprisals. We'll cause more trouble if we... And the old dirty coward who saved his old rotten, dirty neck never opened his mouth. And the Germans picked out 320 of his own people and took them out there in a cave about 17 miles north of Rome and took machine pistols and shot them and bulldozed the cave and covered the cave up. When they got those bodies out of there three months later, when the American Army occupation came in, men had to go out there with the handkerchiefs over their face, dipped in chemicals to keep them puking, and bodies half eaten by, by rats and stuff in there. And some of them had been dying slow in there three and four days at a time in a stink you couldn't imagine. And the Pope never opened his mouth before or during or after. Those were his own church members got killed. That's a pastor. That fellow says he's a bishop of a flock. He's a shepherd with a shepherd's staff. You let him murder 320 of your own church members right in front of you? Never opened your yap? You filthy godless to pray scum you? And I said, with charity, of course. <laughs> <coughs> you know what happened when they lined up those 320? About eight times the fellow would step up and say, uh, could I take his place? He's a young man, he's got two kids and a young wife. I'm up in my 70s, nothing to me. Can I take his place? Sure, get him to take place. You know. They don't care. Just sort of 320. They don't care who gets them. That one Catholic priest got in there for a Jew. <laughs> he said, I believe these Jews are God's ancient people and I don't want to be responsible for the death. Can I take his place? Sure, Father, step in. Blew his brains out. And his superior, our Holy Father in the Vatican, never peeped. The fellow investigated that's got a book that thick on it called Death in Rome. And after thing was over in 1964, he went back to Rome and spent three weeks there trying to run that thing down. And all they gave him was a sidetrack for three weeks. He couldn't get anywhere or get any information at all. But somebody was substitute. Sub you believe in substitution? You believe in substitution? You said, I don't believe it. You're not faithful. If you're faithful, you believe in substitution. All right, we're getting near the end here. Come down by verse 10. You know, in verse 10, you know what it says? It says down in verse 10 that Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay that boy. Going to kill him. Do you ever stop and think about this? How do you ever get him tied up? Said he, he took the boy and tied him up and laid him upon the wood. The boy, is, uh, the boy is 17 years old. About that time, 17 or 18. Who ever heard of a man, a man 119 years old, taking a kid 18 or 19 and tying him down? You couldn't do it. The boy had to lie down there. See, I come to do thy will, O God, and let the old man tie him. That's what's going on. That's what's going on. You see, the whole thing is there. And he stretched forth his hand to slay that boy. Now, that reminds me to say this, that the faithful man acts regardless of the consequences. 
the life of faith, uh, a real faith, is not just uh, you know going ahead and and, and living uh, and having and doing the right thing uh, in spite of the fact that there's no evidence. Real faith is living, doing the right thing in spite of the consequences. That's what real faith is. Real faith is doing right no matter what happens. Whitfield and Wesley one time were discussing this, and Whitfield said, you know something, uh, John, he said, if the Lord were to give me wings, I'd fly for him. And John said, George, if God would tell me to fly, I'd start flying and leave the wings to him. <laughs> now, that's the difference. One fellow would act by faith and just step out and trust God to take care of it. Now, did you ever put yourself in a similar situation where this fellow is here? I have. I thought about these things. When I read my Bible, I try to think. I don't try to leave my brains on the, on the seat when I open the book. And I sit down and I think to myself, now what if God told me to do that? What if God told me to take one of my boys out when he was about 15 or 16, take him out there and cut him, cart out with a knife and then set fire to him? What would I do? You know what I'd do? I'd stall like nothing you ever saw. <laughs> I'd get out there, you know, Check the wind, you know, sharpen the knife two or three times, you know, look at the, make sure I have the right time, you know, and then I try the spirits. <laughs> Get down and pray. Well, did you really tell me that? Well, maybe it was the devil telling me that. Maybe I'd, I'd have messed around there. I'd have put that thing off as long as I could. That bird did. He stretched that bar out there. We should pick the knife and get the knife. He's going to come down to slit his throat mere to ear. Act regardless of the consequences. That's, that's it. That's it. You say, what is that? That's faithfulness. That's why he's called, that's why he's called the friend of God. I guess the greatest illustration I've heard of that in history outside of the Bible was another Japanese. His name was Hirao Anada. And Hirao Anada, ja Anada Japanese uh, uh, infantryman, surrendered to President Marcus of the Philippines in 1974. You know, that is... That's 29 years after World War II was over. 74. 29 years, man. What a thing, man. Think about that. He fought out there in the jungles by himself for 29 years and surrendered in 1974. I'm sure I'm glad we dropped that atom bomb on Japan. And you know where I was when that thing was about to start? I was what they call a staging area. You know what a staging area is? That's the place where they bring a whole bunch of troops together and get them ready for an invasion. That thing was going to be called, that, that uh, invasion was going to be called Olympia. You know, they call them, they call them Sea Lion, different projects, you know, and they, they name, names those operations. That was going to be Olympia. We were a staging area in the Philippines. We were getting ready together, the 86th Division, a bunch of other divisions. We were getting ready to invade the mainland of Japan. Let me tell you something. We'd invaded the mainland of Japan. That had been 50 more times more people killed than were killed by them atom bombs including Japanese. Now, if you don't know that, you don't know nothing about Japanese. I can't, I can't imagine our government being as stupid as it is when it comes to dealing with the Orientals. I know Orientals better than that. I know them. Been over the Philippines twice, been over Korea once, over Japan once. I know those people over there. When a buddy of mine got in, a, in an infantry outfit in Vietnam, must have been about a oh, good while back now, but when he got that infantry outfit, he a big old black uh, a sergeant got a hold of him when he got in his outfit and he knew he was a new recruit just green as grass and he called him aside and he said now he said young fella he said if you want to stay in the life in this here combat the first thing you got to know is this Charlie don't make no deals <laughs> Charlie don't make no deals now you know what he meant by that I know what he meant I know Charlie. <laughs> I mean, Charlie makes up his mind about you before you start, and after that, it's fixed, and you don't get nowhere. You don't get nowhere. That bird, if we hadn't dropped that bomb, you'd be fighting in Japan probably right now. Still going at it. If you got through with them, you'd have China to deal with. Charlie don't make no deal. And he don't. His old Carter, you know, that bunch sitting around, Lyndon Johnson, that bunch of... Dumbbell sitting around the Paris peace talks, talking to the Ho Chi Minh about peace, 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 peace. Ho Chi Minh says, you get out of our country and we'll let you have your POWs back. They said, you give us our POWs back first and we'll get out of our country, your country. He says, you get out of our country first, we'll give them POWs back. They say, you give us our POWs back and we'll get out of that country. You know what happened? We got out, we didn't get POWs back. <laughs> 
Why, when old Chima and that bunch, listen, that bunch, boy, when they, oh, that old mine is going like a, it's going like a pinwheel, boy. I know them. I know them, man. I've ate with them, slept with them, sinned with them, fought with them, talked with them, cussed with them. I know them. I know them. You don't make no deal with Charlie. No way. That fellow out there in the bushes and not have surrendered. You know what he said when they finally turned over his sword and handed over to Marcus? They said, uh, will you hand your sword over to him? He said, uh, I have to have an order. They said, who's your commanding officer? And he said, my commanding officer is Major Tanagichi. And they called him Tanagichi and called him from Japan. He came all the way from Tokyo to Manila. And came there and said, would you give this fellow an order to hand over his sword? And the Major said, hand over your sword. Over it comes. And they asked uh, 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 Onada, they said to him, why, why in the world did you keep this thing up for all these years? Why did you keep on fighting and fighting and fighting the way you did? He said, I had uh, nothing in mind except to obey orders. He said, I had no order to quit. I had no order to uh, surrender. And he said, I had but one thing in mind, and that was to be true to my orders. Boy, I wish I'd give me a church full of folks like that. Now, wouldn't that be something to have a church bunch, a church full of folks like an unsaved Japanese? With those ethical standards? I have but one thing in mind, duty. Amen. 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 Boy, would you have a church and you had a full of fellows like that? And that guy wasn't even saved. The faithful man acts, I say, regardless of the consequences. I mean, here's a little old swallow. You get ready to fly off and head down south. I said, little swallow, where are you going? Oh, I'm going to fly down to South America. I'll be back in a while. I said, well, how do you know where to come back to? Oh, I'll come back here. I say, well, you've never been this nest just until now. First time you know about this nest. Do you have a map? No, I don't have a map. You have a compass? No, I don't have any compass. You ever been down there before? No, I've never been down there before. I say, well, uh, have you got any friends that can talk to you and tell you about how to get down there? No, no, we can't talk. Well, I say, little swallow, how are you going to make this trip, trip of 500 miles down there and then 500 miles back with no compass and no map and no way to know where you're going? Well, the swallow said, well, I don't know. I just kind of feel like God will take care of me. <laughs> and off he flies. And they've taken swallows and taped their leg down there and, and checked them after they've gone down and come back. It'll leave a nest and fly down there five, eight hundred miles and come back to the same nest and the same tree in the same city. You can't do that. There's anybody in this building that can go from here to a particular tree on a particular island or offshore China that you've never been to before, that you don't know the name of, and you have no compass and no map and nobody to talk to before you go. You can't do it. But a bird can do it. You say, why is that? Just trusting God. The animals obey God. The only animal that doesn't obey God is man. I, if God tells the dog to bite you, he'll bite you. <laughs> But God tell the man to do something? Well, now, now, that depends on how you look at it, you know, kind of thing. All right, the faithful man acts regardless of the consequences. What do you do? Reach down there, pick up that knife, going to kill that boy, going to kill him. Keep on reading down through there. Keep on reading down through there. Abraham, then, uh, God called him Abraham out of heaven. The angel of God said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, uh, do nothing to the lad. Fear not, do nothing to the lad. Now seest thou, thou lovest me, do you fear God because you've done this thing? Have withheld your only son from me. And he said, well, what about this sacrifice I'm going to offer? And the angel of the Lord said, there's a ram back there in the bushes caught by the horns. Go back and offer him. And Abraham found a ram caught in the thicket there by the horns and went and offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And then he goes on down there and says this. He says, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And he called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, verse 14. He called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. What does that mean? Jehovah Jireh means God will provide. God will provide. Jehovah Jireh. How will he provide? He'll provide in life. He'll provide in death. He'll provide at the judgment. One time a man said to John R. Rice, he said, Brother Rice, he said, you keep talking about believing on Christ and believing on Christ and believing on Christ and believing on Christ. 
I, I don't know if I believe on Christ or not. He said, would you explain to me just simply, what, what simply does that mean, believe on Christ? What does that mean, simply? You know what Brother Rice said after setting, setting up one of those quick Nehemiah prayers? He said, well, he said, uh, it means God provides the Savior and you provide the sinner. That's good as you'll ever get it. God provides the Savior, you provide the sinner. Now God provided the Savior. Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. God provided the Savior. The question is, is this. The question is, is there a sinner in the house? That's the question. I need a sinner. The Savior's already here. The problem is them sinners. That's the problem. Scarce as hand the teeth these days, man. God will provide in life, in death. God will provide at the judgment. The faithful man acts regardless of the consequences. You know, years ago, there used to be a program called The Passing Parade, uh, narrated by a man named John Nesbitt. I used to like to listen to it, radio program. And that radio program, every year, he'd give the Carnegie Awards for bravery. I haven't heard those given for many a year now. Maybe they don't even give that Carnegie Award out anymore. I don't even know. But back in the old days, they gave what they call a Carnegie Award for bravery. That thing was given out every year to the man they considered to be the bravest man under certain circumstances. And uh, the boy, some of those fellows that they gave that award to, they earned it, boy, they earned it. I heard a lot of them. But my very favorite was a, a Sunday school teacher. i never forget that story. And it wasn't just a story. The fellow, he got the award and he earned it. But he was kind of a milk toast kind of a character. When I say milk toast, uh, that's, a, that's a cartoon character some of you probably don't remember. But Mr. Milk Toast was a real quiet, uh, soft-spoken fellow whose wife ran him, and he he very humble and meek and sweet and quiet. They called him Mr. Milk. It was a cartoon character we used to read. And this fellow was like that. And he was a Sunday school teacher about 50 years old. And out there in Colorado, near Denver someplace, they had a, a church, Baptist church out there that took the young people out uh, on a, a little picnic out there by some old deserted mines and things. And he had a boys' Sunday school class he took with him. They got out there and they played around during the day and played games and stuff and sang choruses and usual stuff, you know. And time came to go back and they round all the kids up and put them on the bus. And they found the two little boys missing. One of them was about eight and one was about six. And the Sunday school teacher told him, he said, well, look, it's getting dark. He said, uh, we can't wait here much longer. The rest of the kids have to get on back. He said, give me a flashlight, and I'll find them. He said, take these kids and run them back into town, which is about 15 miles in the town, and then come back, and I'll have them for you when they get back. So the bus went on into town, took the first load on in. And this fellow got him a flashlight. It hadn't gotten dark yet, but it was getting dark. And he began to look around with those boys and call them, and he couldn't find them anywhere. And then he noticed a, a thing that looked like a well on top of the hill there. He, he knew about it. It was a place where an ore bucket was. But the windlass had rusted years ago, and the oil bucket was just sitting up there, nothing going on, a deserted mine shaft below it. He knew the area real well. And so went up there that thing and looked in and shot his flashlight down there. And when he got close to the place, he noticed the windlass was gone. It unwound. And he got up there and shot that thing down. That oil bucket was down the bottom of that thing, about 25 feet deep, big oil bucket about that big, and both those boys were in it. And the windlass come in right behind him. And one of them was moaning and groaning. The other one was quiet. He wasn't dead, but he was unconscious. And he saw that thing there and realized that nothing he could do about it. And the boys might be, might be, a, might be a matter of minutes for him before something went wrong. And he couldn't get down into the thing. No way to claw down into it. But he knew the area real well. And he knew off about an eighth of a mile away there was an underground shaft, an old deserted mine tunnel that ran down and came out the bottom of that oil bucket was. So he went down and got his flashlight, went back about an eighth of a mile off the side of that thing, and started down this low tunnel about four feet high in some place, about six feet high on another, this deserted shaft to get to the bottom of that uh, well, that oil bucket was. And going down through there, he hadn't gone along through there, I guess more than about, uh, oh, about 100, 200 feet, and he heard, <laughs> in the den of rattlesnakes. And that bird went through there shining that flashlight in those eyes and stepping over those things and around those things and past those things and got in there. And he got in there and he got those boys. He got them under, one under each arm. And he got those boys and started back and put that flashlight in his mouth. And one boy here, one boy here. And then four feet high sometimes, 
scooped out of that thing, he went back up to that shaft and <laughs> all the way up. And he got outside there and he got outside and when he got outside there and came up, the bus had showed up from town. And he got those boys in the bus and took them into town. He never said a word. They said he sat down there and the bus didn't say a word, just stared out the window. And they got home, got those boys in town, he went right straight to his house and went to bed and slept for two days. Never woke up. And then in two days, they said when he woke up, every hair in his head was just as white as a pillowcase. Just as white as snow. They gave him the award. <laughs> you know what he said when they gave him the award? He said, uh, I don't deserve this award. They said, why not? He said, well, I'm not a brave man. He said, I was scared the whole time I was going through that. I was terrified. And they said, that's just why we're giving it to you. They said, a brave man is a man who's afraid and goes ahead anyway and does the right thing. So you get the award. That's Abraham, the faithful man. Are you faithful? If you're faithful, you'll act regardless of the consequences. Ruckman, what if my family breaks up? Have to go, buddy, sister. What if I lose my job? You'll have to look for another one. What if I don't get a Catholic burial? I have to bury you in a dumpster. <laughs> Only one question to ask, boys and girls, and that says, is it right? And if it's right, you do it, and you don't wait. You don't wait. If you're God's friend. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask you to bless upon the message tonight. I pray the Holy Spirit of God will deal with these people tonight. About maybe some things in their life I know nothing about. Some decisions they have to make need to be made, and I pray they'll make them tonight. And most of all, I pray if there's any unsafe person that's heard my voice, tonight will be the night they'll accept your provision for their salvation. You provided for us in life. You've made provision for us in death. You've made provision for us to jump, and you fix things up so we have no, a no answer, no way out. You promised us food and clothing while we're here, and you promised uh, out of death you'll get us home and get us out of these bodies and get us home to glory. You promised when the judgment shows up we'll be appear just like your son, perfect in him and sinless, with no condemnation, blameless in that day. You said in your book, faithful is he that calls you also will do it. We pray for any unsaved man, any unsaved woman, any unsaved boy, any unsaved girl here tonight, that they'll act and act by faith, like Abraham did, and take your provision for them, and not argue and fuss with you about it. Now, some other head bowed and eyes closed in prayer a few minutes. And in a few minutes, we're going to stand and sing. And once again, I want to give you an invitation, an opportunity to confess Christ your Savior. And maybe, maybe, maybe there's some Christian here tonight, and God been putting some on your heart for a good while. You've been hesitating about it and holding back on it and weighing the pros and cons and trying to rationalize and find a way through and maybe you ought to come this order tonight just kneel down here before the Lord and say alright Lord I don't understand it I can't figure it out but I want your will done I want your way done in my life here I am and however it comes out you got the ball you roll it you call the shots Father, bless your word. Bless the invitation for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. 342. 342. Let's stand and sing 342. I gave my life for thee. North here, there's something I've never gotten over, and that's how long it takes some of you Yankees to make up your mind to get saved when you're under conviction, know you should get saved. I hardly ever preach up a time up here where there haven't been two or three unsaved people in every meeting during the week. A couple of them Friday night, a couple of them Saturday night, some of them Sunday morning, some of them Sunday night. 
Usually about a week or two after I leave, they get saved. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for that. I thank God. I don't care how you get saved, as you get saved, but it's always been a puzzle to me. When you know where you are and what you need to do, and you're able to do it, why don't you do it? Amen. You folks up here are fast about everything else. <laughs> you drive fast, you live fast, you know, and you eat fast, you sleep fast. How is it you don't accept Christ fast? What is it that makes you just hold back and what are you turning over your mind? There's nothing to turn over. When the light turns green, you go, man. I guess, I guess the, hardest, the hardest part of living down south is the way they drive down there. At least in Pensacola. I never got used to it. That light turned to green, they sit there and look at it. You come in the lights, you know, and the light turns red and everybody goes. It turns green, everybody stops. So you stand there and it goes green. One guy leaves, the next guy looks around a while, and then he leaves. The next guy, you know, looks out the window and he leaves. And then five minutes later, it's red and you, when you get to it. And up here and over in Germany, when that light goes yellow, the clutches go out. And by the time it's in the green, the 10 cars going right down. Why is it you're so quick and efficient and those kind of things come to a thing like this? You mess and mess and mess and mess. There's nothing to mess with. If you haven't accepted God's Son as your Savior, you ought to. Amen? Amen. Amen. Or if you ought to, you ought to do it now. Amen? Amen. All right, let's do it. Now do it. Make, make your legs do it the toe. Let's sing, brother. My father's house.